All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Invasive Species Center's webinar series. My name is Alex Podica, and I am the uh, entomology research intern at the Invasive Species Center. I will be your moderator today. The Invasive Species Center respectfully acknowledges uh, that our head office is located on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabe, the Batuana, and the Garden River First Nations, as well as the longtime settlement of the Métis people in the Robin Robinson Huron Treaty area. <clears throat> the Invasive Species Center is a nonprofit organization that connects stakeholders, knowledge, and technology to prevent the uh, introduction and spread of invasive species that harm Canada's environment, economy, and society. Uh, we've got uh, we've got lots of great invasive species resources on our website, including species profiles, best management practices, and more. So check out ch check us out at www.invasivespeciescenter.ca. You can also sign up uh, on our webpage for our newsletter, uh, biweekly media scan, and event invitations, uh, which is where you can hear about upcoming upcoming webinars. Uh, the ISC has launched a new invasive species training program that offers virtual courses on topics related to invasive species. We currently have two courses available which focus on different forest invasives, uh, but we'll be releasing new content regularly, so stay tuned for that. Um, make sure to check out our website and sign uh, up to receive updates on when uh, these new courses become available. Uh, before we get started with today's webinar, there are a couple things I wanted to uh, I would like to mention there will be time for questions at the end of the webinar. So if you have any questions at any time, please type them in the question box and I'll read them to the, our presenter after the webinar. If you're having te technical difficulties at any time, please type them in the chat box or respond to the email found in your registration and we will try to, to, resolve, to resolve it for you. Uh, we have enabled closed captioning. So if you'd like to follow along that way, you can turn that on on the closed, ca closed caption button on your taskbar. Lastly, there will be a very brief summary uh, following the webinar. Uh, if you could take the time to fill it, sorry, not summary, survey. Very brief survey following the webinar. If you'd like to take the time to fill that out, we'd really appreciate it. Uh, today's webinar is titled, uh, Understanding Nidadula Day, the Vector for Oak Wilt. I'm pleased to uh, uh, introduce our speaker, David Dukevich. Uh, David is uh, an entomology technician at the Invasive Species Center. He has 14 years of uh, insect identification experience, uh, as well as studying um, nidadula beetles uh, related to oak wilt. And he has a paper published on new records of beetle species in the nidadula day family in Canada, Ontario, and Manitoba. Um, so thank you for joining us today, David. Uh, I'll, I'll pass it over to you. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Alex. Appreciate that. Um, I'll start sharing my screen. Here we go. Hopefully you can see that. Yep, all good. All right, excellent. So, um, I'm just going to stop sharing my video here so that uh, um, that works perfect. Okay, so uh, I just wanted to go over this webinar today and talk about some of the new doulets that we've been uh, collecting off of Oak Wilt. Um, just to sort of uh, introduce uh, to some people sort of uh, that there are new, new doulets that have sort of had a range expansion, uh, but also look at more of uh, nitidulid uh, biology and a little bit of, uh, you know, what kinds of species we're finding on oak wilt trees and things like that, or oak wilt related trees. Um, so, like I said, I'm just going to go over oak wilt uh, sort of uh, a little bit more in depth, uh, talk about the nitidulids that are found in Canada, as well as, as well as, um, the range expansion. So what uh, uh, Dr. Sharon Reed from the Ontario Forest Research Institute and myself have been identifying and, and seeing over the past 
uh, number of years since 2008 when we started, or when she started this uh, experiment of oak wounding uh, and trapping ninodulids. And I have been doing the identification side of things, um, as well as a little bit of detection, uh, which is something we have to put in for all oak wilt uh, related uh, items because they're very handy to have. Uh, so just a brief overview of oak wilt. Um, so the origins of oak wilt are still unknown. Um, there have been uh, reports from old uh, forestry documents that have been dating back to the late 1800s uh, in Wisconsin uh, that have described oak wilt-like symptoms, uh, but it was first formally uh, described in 1944. And uh, it was sort of found in uh, Wisconsin, uh, Minnesota, Illinois, as well as uh, Iowa. So that's when it was first, uh, they uh, looked at it and they actually described the actual species of oak wilt. Um, it was thought to have a, a single point of origin, uh, a single point of introduction into the States. Um, but we're still uncertain of it. And uh, it is thought to have uh, originated from sort of South, uh, South America, Mexico, and uh, into the uh, Northern part of South America. So that's where, we're, where we think it's come from, um, but uh, that research is still under underway. So currently uh, it can be found in 24 states throughout uh, the US. Uh, in Canada uh, this year, we've had two uh, detections, two separate detections, uh, both of which are over 100 kilometers away from the nearest uh, oak wilt detection in the United States. Um, so uh, in order for them to have gotten here, uh, there has to be some sort of movement involved. Uh, in Niagara, uh, there's been two detections uh, with uh, dead trees involved. So um, we're suspecting that this um, oak wilt has been there for a couple of years. Just no one has uh, detected it yet. Uh, the next uh, uh, point of entry is in Springwater Township, uh, which is just one detection. Uh, and it's showing just browning leaves. And this detection was found through um, uh, people who have called in uh, with showing leaves and we actually uh, caught that quite early, which is good. So um, yeah. uh, just to give you some perspective, uh, these are sort of the distribution maps of oak wilt or of oak trees. So this is just one of uh, red oak and this is one of bur oak. So if you look back at our map, um, here you can see that pretty much everything in green is close to the areas that are um, oak distribution, oak distributed throughout uh, North America. Um, so there's still quite a ways to go in Canada, but in the States, it's, it's pretty much at the range, except uh, for some of these small, uh, lower south, southern states. So oak will can still be uh, introduced into those areas. Um, so with oak wilt, uh, there's a difference in susceptibility to oak wilt uh, with the uh, corcus uh, section, which is mostly your white oaks and things like that. Um, it tends to be less susceptible, more of a slow moving uh, wilt in those types of trees. So your uh, white oaks, your swamp white oaks, bur oaks, uh, chinkapee, those types of oaks, uh, you'll get more of a branch flagging rather than an entire tree uh, collapsing within a, a, a growing season. Uh, whereas in the uh, lombolite uh, section of the Quercus genus, um, it, it tends to move quite rapidly. So for red oaks, for example, you can have an oak tree that dies within uh, one growing season or within you know a month of the infect in uh, festation. Uh, so the northern pin oak, pin oaks, red oaks, those types of things are are highly susceptible uh, to uh, oak wilt. So 
I wanted to get into a little bit of what oak wilt actually, or what oak wilt does in trees. So if you can remember back to um, your plant biology, uh, we're talking about the vascular tissue of the tree, and that's what really um, affects by a wilt disease. So um, this vascular tissue is uh, consi uh, consists of three main things. So the xylem, the cambium, and the phloem. Uh, the xylem uh, basically distributes water uh, and dissolved minerals from uh, the uh, takes it from the roots and moves it upwards into the trees, uh, providing water to the leaves and things like that, uh, as well as minerals uh, that it's collected from the soil. The cambium layer, it's that area of new growth in the wood. It's what makes the rings in the trees. Uh, it expands the tree and, and allows things to grow. Uh, the phylum, uh, it carries uh, sugars uh, either downwards or upwards from the, the tree. Uh, it carries uh, hormones and things like that as well, um, essentially uh, moving sugars and things uh, either from the leaves to the roots uh, and sort of goes from there. And that's where um, these wilts actually uh, get take hold in those uh, nutrient-rich uh, tissues. So like I said, uh, wilts, um, go after this nutrient-rich vascular tissue uh, and spread throughout the tree. So what happens is, is the fungus uh, tends to get into the vascular tissue and gum up uh, that water and minerals that are, are being translocated throughout the tree. And it, it slows and, and stops in some cases uh, that... Um, movement of, of uh, water and materials up to the leaves. And this causes uh, either the leaves to wilt or to actually drop and senesce from the tree, so actually fall from the tree. Uh, the, what the tree does, actually, is it tries to uh, defend against this uh, and block off these vascular tissues and block off the fungus from getting any further. So it actually uses this... Um, this uh, uh, tylose, uh, which is a balloon-like structure that sort of forms in the xylem and blocks off uh, those areas where uh, the fungus is trying to move. So as you can see here, uh, this darker tissue is where the xylem uh, is where the, the fungus is, and uh, the um, tree actually gums up these areas and blocks them from moving further. Uh, around the tree and preventing it from curdling itself. So in oak wilt, um, this, uh, like I said, is a vascular disease and the fungal hyphae actually uh, clog up the uh, vascular tissue of the xylem. And so, like I said before, the tree actually tries to uh, prevent this from happening and tries to block off the, um, the fungus from getting any further. However, uh, the fungus uh, tends to grow a little bit more rapidly and with the combination of the tree trying to defend itself and block off all those areas and the fungi, uh, fungus growing, it uh, causes uh, rapid uh, mortality in these uh, oak trees. Um, so there's a couple different ways that oak wilt is transmitted. So root to root uh, transmission is really... Uh, transmission through basically from one tree to another um, in a very close radius. So when you see uh, this picture here, you have, you know, the dead trees uh, forming and then you have these lighter brown trees on the edges. So this would be something like a root to root uh, transfer, you know, maybe somewhere in here, there was a ground zero tree and it slowly spread outwards. And you can see over in the far uh, left-hand corner, there's another tree that uh, is being affected there. Um, so it sort of radiates uh, from the point of origin. Um, and these graphs um, are found, uh, oaks tend to talk to each other on the, under the ground and uh, they'll produce these root graphs and that's how oak wilt gets from one tree to another. Uh, oak wilt can remain uh, transmissible throughout the, the ground. 
uh, for several years after the oak tree has died. So um, if the oak tree, for example, that you're, you're trying to treat or deal with, uh, if it dies and you remove the tree, uh, remove the stump, uh, the roots are still um, able to transmit uh, oak wilt uh, through those grafts uh, for several years afterwards. Um, hence why one of the main um, management options is to disrupt those root graftings. Um, another reason uh, oak or another way oak wilt is transmitted. So if it can't um, transmit through the roots, then it will transmit through these uh, fruiting bodies that uh, are formed. Uh, the pressure pads uh, are formed uh, once the oak tree has died. Uh, and what they do is once uh, the tree has has actually died, uh, the pressure pads uh, begin to form in that uh, cambium layer uh, that is now dead. And it basically produces this, what's called a foot, which pushes uh, the bark away from the tree and it causes the tree to crack. Uh, and it also produces this very strong fruity smell. Uh, some people say it smells like juicy fruit. Some people smell uh, say it smells like wine and like a very um, sweet smelling odor, which attracts uh, knitted doolid beetles. So uh, knitted doolid beetles uh, are known to transmit uh, oak wilt. Uh, they tend to like anything that smells the best. I always say uh, they like things like, uh, you know, rotting fruit. Uh, they like, um, you know, very fruity smelling uh, things, uh, all different types of, of, of uh, very strong smells. So this fungus actually, uh, oak wilt, uh, takes advantage of that um, attraction uh, and uh, sort of lures them in. And these knitted doolids will feed uh, on the pressure pads. Uh, and you can see uh, here in one of these beetles um, that they're covered in spores. So once they're covered in spores, they'll uh, fly away after they've finished eating uh, off of the, the pressure pad and they'll move from uh, one area, uh, one tree to another tree uh, in order to find uh, a new um, meal, I guess you, you'd say. Uh, so those meals can be presented. Uh, these are sap beetles, remember? Nidodulids are sap beetles, so they like to go after all different types of, of sap. And um, if uh, people have things like storms, uh, construction, um, you know, any types of damage to oak trees, these beetles will, will say, oh, there's a meal over here and go over to that tree. And if they're covered in oak wilt spores, then they've now gone to a new uh, wound of a tree and they're, they're quite small so they can get into tight spaces and those spores will then get into the tree. Um, so like I said, uh, here's on the bottom here, there's some damage from probably vehicles um, around this tree here. Here's storm damage and then uh, pruning activity on above. Um, so the pressure pads occur uh, after the mortality of the tree, usually the year after uh, the, the tree has actually died. Um, and they're commonly formed in sort of late spring, uh, early fall. So basically around uh, April to May is when they usually start to form and into uh, um, like early June. And they also form in the fall time as well. Uh, however, most uh, infection is, is usually done in the spring, but it can happen in the fall as well. Um, this is usually due to like wet weather, like if we have a uh, spring where it's rained a lot, so the, the fungus has a, a lot of moisture, so it can grow very healthily uh, throughout the tree. Uh, the high levels of moisture in the, in the wood is always great. Uh, funguses and things like that don't necessarily like um, very dry weather. So that's why uh, usually if there's um, like heavy rains and things like that, uh, they tend to do uh, a lot better. Um, 
when it comes to the range of nitidulid flight, uh, they tend to vary. Uh, most nitidulids, so about one third of the nitidulid uh, population tends to not go very far. Uh, so this paper here was on flight performance of nitidulids. Um, and they looked at uh, two species or two genera, uh, three species of Stellodota, which they found were very weak flyers. They didn't tend to go very much farther than 100 meters or so. Um, the Carpophilus, uh, there's two species of Carpophilus they used, and they tend to be more stronger flyers. Uh, essentially, uh, one third maintained a 100 meter radius. Uh, two thirds was basically between uh, 100 to two kilometers away from a uh, point of origin. And then there is the overachievers, the one presenters that, that were actually make, able to make it uh, greater distances than two kilometers. Uh, so keep that in mind uh, when uh, you're dealing with oak wilt and uh, what types of species you're dealing with. So if you have a lot of Stellodota near, then uh, they might not be going very large areas. But, uh, you know, if you have Carpophilus, which is usually the case, uh, you know, that area of flight might be a little bit larger. Um, one of the biggest ways that oak wilt can be transmitted is through firewood movement. Um, the, like I said before, the beetles don't tend to go anywhere farther than, you know, two kilometers of radius around an infected tree. But if you're finding oak wilt transmission, uh, you know, like hundreds of kilometers away from oak wilt areas, it's usually probably due to human movement of some kind. Um, oak trees, for example, if, you know, someone has an oak tree that's wilted and died from oak wilt uh, that year they cut it up take it down uh you know maybe unsuspecting and they say oh this is going to be great firewood for the cottage uh they'll cut that tree down and then they'll transport it to their cottage uh let it dry over the winter time for next year and that is when the pressure pads start to emerge, start to uh, grow from the uh, from the bucked up wood. Uh, so it allows those nanodulins that are in the area to now come to those pressure pads that have uh, been that are formed in the firewood, and then the nanodulins will go uh, from there and affect trees in the area. So uh, that's why one of the big things uh, with oak wilt we're stressing about not moving firewood. Uh, to prevent um, these types of, of occurrences. So we'll dive right into the nitidulid species that, that can be found in Canada. So in Canada, there's seven different uh, subfamilies. Uh, there's three different tribes of those subfamilies, and uh, there's about uh, 31 uh, genera and 105 different species that can be found in Canada. Um, I like to think of them, and a lot of people agree with me, is essentially they're little brown beetles that no one really pays attention to uh, because they're not flashy. Uh, some of them have some colors and patterns to them, but for the most part, they are like this rusty brown brick color, uh, or they can be black. Uh, they're oval in shape. They're not very big, so they can be anywhere from... 1.3 up to the largest, uh, which can be upwards of 12 and a half millimeters. So essentially, um, but the majority of them are between like the two millimeters and six millimeters. So they're not even a centimeter in length. So they are usually you need a hand lens in order to differentiate species or a microscope. Um, like I said before, some of them tend to have some more interesting modeling on their backs. They might have, uh, um, you know, like these ones here with his different uh, types of four spots um, or like uh, gradients of, of coloration on their back. But usually they're either sort of a black colored or um, a, a brownie uh, reddy tinge color. Uh, their diet consists of, they like flowers, they like pollinating flowers. There are a number of nidodulidae species that will pollinate flowers. Uh, they do enjoy uh, fungi um, as a, a meal. Um, 
like the ones that go after oak wilt. Uh, they like decaying fruit or vegetables. They tend to be associated with uh, crops and things like that. Uh, some are associated with uh, bee nests, wasp nests, ants nests, those kinds of things. Uh, you can find them on carrion. Uh, as well as different store grains. So basically whatever has the strongest scent, uh, they they really enjoy it um, and they'll tend to go towards those areas. And different um, types of tree uh, sap flows and things like that. So some can some nitidulids can be found, you know, on, on pines and things like that. Other nitidulids can be found on um, like hardwoods and things and they can bounce from uh, basically from tree to tree uh, as they go. So uh, some of the main uh, nitidulid species that are associated with oak wilt, uh, one is this uh, um, Coleopteris truncatus. Uh, and it's a beetle that can be found basically throughout North America. Um, its flight season is roughly between April and July. Uh, it's it has some interesting modeling on the back. It's mostly a darker colored species, but there is some uh, you know lighter uh, colors. One of its main uh, distinguishing features is it has short elytra. So uh, the thing that covers the structure that covers the wings, it tends to be shorter, so you can actually see uh, usually uh, three segments uh, sort of poking out, three abdominal segments sort of poking out. So that's one of the uh, easy ways to identify it. Um, it's frequently collected in oak wilt mats. Um, so it is one of the species. It tends to be a very flat uh, species, so it can really get into uh, bark cracks and things like that. And I've uh, heard reports that uh, when people are trapping for this uh, particular uh, beetle, um, for example, uh, if you have a, um, a uh, bait that you have to sort of screw on and then there's a screen on top, these beetles will try and crawl up into the, the screw part of the uh, trap in order to try and bypass the screen to get to the bait. So they are, they tend to be able to get into small cracks and things like that. And so that's why they're one of the great species that uh, will get into uh, those bark cracks that um, the, that are associated with uh, oak wilt. Uh, Carpophilus sei uh, is another uh, species that is highly associated with oak wilt. Uh, it can be found um, basically from Saskatchewan to Nova Scotia. Uh, it's a very um, sort of Northeastern uh, species. Uh, its flight period can be anywhere from May to October. Uh, it's, like I said, frequently collected at oak wilt mats. Um, it's collected uh, from reports. It's been collected under uh, wood chips. So if... if um, Say, for example, there's mulch and things like that that people have created from uh, chopping wood. Uh, it can be associated with those that can be found underneath those uh, wood chips uh, feeding on the fungi and stuff like that that's grown. Uh, it can also be uh, found on fresh cut stumps. So if um, you know you were to cut a tree down, uh, say an oak tree, for example, there still be sap that sort of comes up, and this is one of those species that will go to those fresh cuts uh, stumps. It's also associated with uh, corn and is considered an agri agricultural pest as well. Uh, Epurea avara is another species. Um, this is a very uh, it sort of has this like goldish color to it. Uh, they all look very, very similar to uh, this, this goldy color. Um, and it can be found basically across uh, Canada um, in almost every province. Its flight period can be uh, in April as well throughout October. Uh, it's associated with uh, firewood. Like there have been several reports where they pe people have found this beetle associated with uh, stacks of firewood. Uh, and it was most commonly uh, collected on oak wounds. 
Uh, so in the States, they actually haven't been finding this species too much on their oak wound traps, but in Canada, uh, with Sharon Reed's work, we've been finding it all, all over the place uh, in mostly all of our traps. Uh, Chrysocrelis species. Um, this is one of the larger uh, nidodulid species. They can be found pretty much uh, everywhere uh, in Canada as well. Uh, their flight season tends to be between April and July, uh, and they can be collected frequently on oak wounds. Um, previously, most of my pictures have been as, uh, that uh, I've shown today. Um, this beetle right here uh, was one of the ones, I think it's the most photogenic of most of the nidodulid beetles, so that's why people tend to, tend to uh, take photos of it. Um, but uh, it's one of the easy ones to sort of pick out. Uh, and um, it tends to uh, show up sort of later to uh, the wounds, uh, oak wounds, but uh, it uh, will be associated with all, all different types of oak wounds. Um, I thought I'd just throw this in here. This was a really good uh, sort of poster that you can find online. Um, I just uh, sort of searched, did a web search for nindadulid beetles associated with oak wilt and sort of this uh, poster popped up. Uh, I think it's produced by uh, the New York um, state uh, government there. And it's a really cool poster because it shows uh, quite a number of different nindadulid species. And uh, if, if you want to sort of look in, further at which new to do let's can be sort of highly associated with oak wilt. This is a really good one to, to show and the, and the PDF is, is available as well. Um, so I'll get into sort of the experiment that uh, Dr. Sharon Reed uh, has been doing as well as uh, what sort of I've been doing in order to uh, help with the project and we'll talk about the new to do let sort of range expansion. So this project uh, was started in 2018 and uh, has been running to 2021. Um, and we were looking at trying to understand the flight behavior uh, between 21 locations throughout Manitoba, Ontario, and uh, New Brunswick. So essentially the goal of this was to look at the uh, biodiversity of nidadulids in, in Canada. Um, Nindadula research uh, is more directed towards a lot of the uh, agricultural side of things. Uh, however, uh, this is uh, now with oak wilt being so close to Canada, we really started to start to take a look at what is Nindadula's uh, nidadulid beetles uh, potential uh, for oak wilt transmission in Canada. So we've sort of been looking at a lot of different factors and which beetles are going to which traps and those kinds of things. Uh, so uh, we did uh, um, several um, flight intercept traps uh, that were installed in sort of red oak or baroque forests. Uh, they tended to be lingered funnel traps, um, wind oriented wind oriented traps and they've been baited with uh, either fermenting bread dough as well as a commercial lure. So these are the wind traps in the bottom here and then these are the flight uh, intercept traps in the uh, top picture. Uh, so what beetles did we actually found uh, find in uh, that were either new to a province or either new to uh, Canada. So we found uh, eight beetles that I'll go over quickly. Um, so uh, Carpophilus antiquus uh, was new to Ontario. It could be found in Manitoba and Quebec. Uh, and it was found in sort of the Windsor area and London area. Uh, it tends to be associated with uh, corn but also associated with uh, fruit. Uh, it's been found on the bark of uh, pine trees, uh, as well as uh, in wood chips uh, that have come from oak trees. So uh, it's one of the uh, species of concern uh, since it does like to go and uh, be associated with those uh, wood chipping from oaks. Uh, Carpophilus uh, cornatus, uh, it's a new one uh, that was detected in Canada and Ontario. Um, 
so it's a species that can be found uh, sort of in the states and the northern parts of the states, but now we've actually detected it in, in Canada. Uh, and it can be found basically from Windsor, London, Hamilton, Guelph area. So with that many detections, it's assumed that it's probably been here for a while. Um, and it tends to be associated with oak or with tree wounds, uh, fruits, uh, cherry flowers. Uh, it's been collected in. Uh, it has specifically been collected from uh, oak sap flows. So if uh, oak trees have been damaged, uh, this beetle can be associated with it uh, underneath bark, as well as uh, it was reported on uh, recently cut maples as well. Uh, Carpophilus lugubrius. Uh, so this one was found in basically uh, the western half of Canada. Um, and now as uh, we were able to detect it in, in Manitoba, in the Winnipeg area, so it sort of just filled in uh, a dot going across into the western half of the, the country. Uh, it can be associated with uh, over-ripened fruit as well as uh, veggie, uh, like vegetables and things like that, uh, corn, uh, and it's also associated with uh, beehives as well. Uh, Carpophilus uh, Nipos. Um, it's a new one that was found in Canada. Uh, it's more of a metropolitan uh, species, so it can actually be found sort of all over the world. Uh, but it was recently detected in, in Manitoba and Ontario. We were able to identify it, and it was collected pretty much across all of our, our study plots. So Windsor, uh, Ottawa, Hamilton, uh, London, Guelph, uh, and Winnipeg. And it's one that's associated with mostly rotting fruit or really ripened fruit, uh, but uh, all different types of fruits and veggies you can find it in. Uh, Carpophilus sei was one I mentioned before. Uh, it was detected in basically Saskatchewan, Manitoba, Quebec, and uh, the Eastern Maritime Provinces, New, New Brunswick and Saskatchewan. And now we just basically have added Ontario to this uh, list of um, places it can be found. Uh, it's found in Sault Ste. Marie, uh, Peterborough, Ottawa, Hamilton, uh, North Bay, London. So it's pretty widespread across Ontario um, that we found it. Uh, it's mostly associated with hardwood uh, wounds, but also uh, with corn. So I've read different uh, papers where they've actually been trying to look at different uh, flight intercept traps. And usually if they're looking at biodiversity and it's next to a corn field. So if you're uh, trying to trap in like uh, hardwood, um, uh, like uh, woodlot blocks that are next to corn fields, uh, you're most likely going to be inundated with uh, Carpophila sei. So that was one of the things uh, I was reading about uh, that people had trouble when they were trying to do biodiversity um, trapping program projects. If there is corn or corn nearby, uh, they can usually find that this particular uh, species uh, was around. So if you have uh, places where you have oak trees around, uh, cornfields and things like that, it, this species might be a, um, pop up uh, more and more uh, around those areas. Um, it'd be interesting to actually do a study to, in order to uh, see if there is any correlation between areas of corn and oak stands. Um, but that's for another project. Uh, the next one is this uh, adjusted species. Um, it was uh, found in Manitoba in the Winnipeg area. Uh, it's known as a fungal feeder. Uh, so it feeds on different types of funguses as well as uh, flowers uh, it's been found in. Uh, so essentially you can find it basically Manitoba East uh, throughout Canada. I had mentioned uh, Stella Dodo before. Uh, Stella dota uh, colonosus is another species that can be found. Uh, new, it's found in Ontario now. Uh, it was previously only known to be in uh, New Brunswick, but we've uh, detected it in the Guelph area. So it's another uh, species that, um, you know, 
is associated with uh, sap flows of trees and it's also associated with um, the larvae have been found to feed on acorns of oak trees. Uh, so it can be associated with oaks as well, uh, as well as fruit. It, it's attracted to fruit. Uh, Grisocrelis uh, obtusis. Um, it's a new species to Canada and Ontario. Uh, we've only had uh, one collection of it in Peterborough, so it's more of a rarer species um, that we've collected. Uh, it's associated with sap flows of trees and can be found underneath barks. It's actually one of the larger uh, species um, of Grisocrylus and of Nidadulids. So this is the one that uh, can be upwards of 12, cent, uh, 12 millimeters in length. So it's it's quite a big and noticeable beetle, uh, but we only were able to manage to collect uh, one or two of these individuals. So what are some takeaway uh, sort of discussion methods or discussions that we've uh, come from uh, this experiment? So uh, the introduction of uh, Carpophilus um, Cornatus, Nepos, and Gracilis, uh, Grisocrylus uh, obtusis uh, are now in Canadian records. So we have them listed as uh, now being found in Canada. Um, so it's three introductions into Canada. Uh, we filled in some of the gaps in the literature. So um, things like uh, Lugubris that was found in Ontario, as well as Saskatchewan and West. Um, you know, it's now found in Manitoba, so, you know, you can find them all through there. A Carpophilus sei, same thing, uh, as well as some of the other ones. So we sort of uh, allowed more research into uh, knowing where these species can be found. Um, when it comes to invasive species, uh, research all of these uh, genera that we have listed and that we've found uh, can be found in the states on oak wilt mats. So those are the concerning things is, you know, we're providing uh, more information to the research, but we're also uh, those um, species and those uh, genera can be found on oak wounds and things like that. Uh, so one of the big questions a lot of people talk about is, you know, uh, the big slogan in the states is don't prune in may and june well in canada we've been doing a lot of uh sharon has been doing a lot of uh flight data research and we're finding that um these beetles tend to be active sort of throughout the summer periods uh into the fall period as well so um the native doulids overwinter as adults and they're almost one of the first um species to sort of thaw out uh, and uh, come out and, and start feeding in the early spring. Um, the larvae develop over the summertime, and then there's another semi-active uh, sort of period of these adults before they develop those uh, um, antifreeze sort of uh, chemicals in their body in order to prepare for the next winter. So um, one of the things we have been discussing is no pruning uh, oak trees between May and October, sort of to pre prevent the transmission uh, of oak wilt by these beetles. So like I had said before, um, the oak mats tend to form in the springtime as well as in the fall time. Uh, and these beetles, that's when they're active as well. So if you were to say uh, prune trees, um, you know, it's more advisable to do that in the wintertime, sort of mark the trees that you want, or the branches or things like that, that you want to prune and, and get rid of, uh, and then um, uh, do it during the, the off season when the beetles are no longer active. If there are storms and things like that, uh, or if there's construction, it's usually advised to uh, use arborist paint in order to uh, prevent the beetles from wanting to be attracted to those. There are some uh, fungi and things like that that are associated with those paints. However, if you are in an area where oak wilt is present, it's uh, more, it's, you want to prevent the, um, the oak wilt from getting into those trees because oak wilt is a death sentence for trees. It's you. It's 
not curable. So the other diseases and things like that that might be associated are more of a lesser thing. Um, so I'll just go over, uh, briefly go over some reporting uh, and detection. Um, so if you happen to find oak wilt um, and, or you suspect oak wilt, uh, these are the two places that you should really uh, be looking at in order to um, uh, report uh, your oak wilt finds. So the Canadian Food Inspection Agency has a 1-800 number you can call. However, uh, if you do a web search for CFIA oak wilt, it'll bring you right to the oak wilt uh, reporting page. And there's that green button at the bottom of the, at the sort of midway down the page uh, that says report an oak wilt. Those are the best things uh, to click on because you can submit pictures and things like that, as well as the invading species hotline, which is more specific to Ontario. They have a, a toll-free number that you can call to report, uh, but they also have, uh, if you go to web search, uh, invading species hotline, it'll bring you to the Ontario Invaded Species Awareness Program, and you can uh, submit uh, a report of sighting from there. So what are the, some of the things that we're looking for? You want to take photos. We like photos. Um, hopefully everyone has access to a cell phone camera or a digital camera of some kind. Um, you know, the, the early leaf drop, um, close-ups of the leaves are really good uh, to have so that we can make accurate identifications. Um, things like uh, full photos of the trees are also good. Um, Usually a series of photos is, is very helpful for identification. So like I said before, if the leaves are, are dying from the top down, uh, that's usually associated with some sort of uh, wilting or some sort of girdling of the tree. Uh, branch flagging, if it's, if it's a, uh, a white oak or things like that, you might see some branch flagging. So take some photos of that. Um, it's not recommended to uh, actually take samples yourself. Um, but um, you can see this, uh, the wilt is that dark ring around this cross section of a branch here. Uh, bark cracking, like I said before, you'll tend to see in normal oak trees, they have this reddish colored cracks that sort of appear. That's sort of normal cracking. It's this style of crack. See how it's sort of been pushed away and it's sort of, uh, it's splitting. That's uh, due to oak wilt and due to a fungal pad underneath or a pressure pad underneath. Um, this was an oak stand uh, that uh, was killed in Michigan uh, from 2018, I believe. Uh, and uh, this is sort of what the stand looked like. Uh, here is some of, this is a stand as well. Here are some of the pressure pads that they were finding on the trees. Uh, they just cut these away essentially in order to see these actual pressure pads. And so here's another forest picture and here's a close up of one of the, the fungal foots. So this whitish colored material is it's what's pushing this uh, bark away from the tree. Here's a, a picture of some of the leaves. Um, sort of, you see how it's uh, here, it's sort of like the chloroplasts are being pulled away from the, the outermost parts of the leaves and drawn into the stem. That's essentially the, the wilt that we're, we've, I've been discussing. Uh, I wanted to go over a couple quickly, some other diseases that you might find. So anthracnose tends to have a very defined line uh, in your oak trees. Uh, and it can go after the midrib as well. Uh, oak wilt, like I said, it's more of a fading from the edge to the, the midrib. Uh, and there's uh, bacterial leaf scorch, uh, which is another one that you can find. It tends to be more of a defined uh, area of brownness uh, in between the green and the brown. It's not that fading. Um, 
things that a lot of people might be seeing this year, especially in Southern Ontario, the MNRF have been reporting uh, frost damage. So you see this was the initial leader for this year, but unfortunately it died due to frost. Uh, and then you have the uh, next or the the other buds taking over from this dead one. So those are some other diseases that you might get confused, but hopefully that will help in uh, identification of oak wilt. So if you have any questions, uh, any more questions, we can answer them now today. Uh, if not, uh, here's my information uh, if you uh, want to uh, get in contact with me. So with that, I will put my camera on and we'll see about some questions. All right. Um, someone asked, they just finished the oak wilt course yesterday and they believe they said oak wilt produces uh, tyloses, which are often an effective defense. Red oaks do not produ produce tyloses and so do not, so do not uh, uh, defend effectively. Is your information an updated explanation of the course of the, the disease? Uh, that is a good question that I'm going to have to do a little bit more research on. Um, but essentially, uh, that's sort of the mechanisms on how uh, oh, wilts work in uh, in trees. So. Um, I want to do a little bit more information research in order to uh, go over the tile season and understand it a little bit better. My expertise is mostly with um, entomology side of things. So the disease side, I'm still brushing up on it. All right. Um, can the spores be spread by wind? Uh, usually they're associated with the beetles. Uh, the spores don't sort of penetrate out of the uh, bark. That's why they sort of push away in the cracks and the beetles will go in. The spores also can't be transmitted through the soil as well. So they really need uh, to either have contact or be spread through uh, the beetles. Okay. Uh, what is your recommendation for what to use uh, to cover the pruning wounds to protect against the sap? Um, I think uh, arborist paint uh, is usually uh, one of the most uh, suggested. Uh, there are some um, some pros and cons to using arborist paint, but if you're in an area uh, with, um, and I have heard of people using latex paint as well, uh, so I don't have recommendations on the actual uh, paint to use. You might have to do your own research. But uh, like I said, there's pros and cons. If you're in a, an area where there's oak wilt or there might be oak wilt in those areas, then it is advisable to, you know, paint wounds if you have to make pruning wounds. Uh, if you're not in an area where there's oak wilts, uh, then it might be better just to leave them open. Uh, but the whole thing that we're trying to get out is to make sure that you're not pruning your trees during those times when the beetles are flying. So, uh, you know, throughout the spring season, don't be pruning your, your oak trees because that's when uh, oaks are highly susceptible to them, uh, to um, transmission of, of the disease. So if you can try to, put your pruning off until later in the season. If there's some trees that you, or if there's some branches that you want to flag, just sort of spray paint them so that you know which ones they are after the leaves fall and then prune them uh, at a later date. All right. Uh, where do nididulid beetles overwinter? Uh, it varies between species. So a lot of them will try to um, you know, some of them are in soils, some of them are uh, in the smallest cracks and crevices, some of them are hiding in like the small folds of, of uh, houses and things like that. Um, anywhere they can find a place to hide, 
Uh, a lot of them can be under wood piles. Um, a lot of them, mostly them, uh, mostly they're associated with a lot of fruits and agriculture. So they tend to be around those types of areas as well. All right, uh, please clarify the no cutting time in Canada. Um, it's April to November while the US is May to October. Um, so we're trying to err on the side of caution. Uh, April to November is sort of more or less uh, the flight periods that we found. Uh, there was a question uh, last week that had asked about um, sort of high temperature. If, if there is like a spike in 20 degree weather in November, would we find the beetles um, sort of becoming more active. Uh, more research has to be done on that just to understand this, those more uh, temperature fluctuations. Uh, so that's why we're trying to err on the side of caution. You know, April's when we can find them in the traps. I think the earliest we've found uh, some of the beetles were, you know, just at the end of end of March, and we found them into late November or mid-November as well. So that's why we're sort of erring on the side of caution until we can understand the data a little bit better. Okay. Uh, do the beetles fly at night? Uh, I've seen them fly during the day, although I haven't been out at night in order to actually observe uh, the beetle flights. Uh, so we've seen them sort of crawling all over the place during the day, but um, I'm not sure about nighttime. I'm assuming they are active, though. How does oak wilt affect young trees up to eight years old? Are they less susceptible due to, due to the immature formation of bark material at that age? Are root grafts the primary method of transferring young oaks? Looking for advice on newly planted oaks within two meters of each other. I will have to look up that answer for you um, in order to understand that a little bit better. Um, any idea of the probability of getting infected if exposed? Uh, it also depends on the species that is going to the tree. So um, some nidadulid beetles have been shown that they're more susceptible to uh, transmitting uh, the fungus over other ones. Some nidadulids, they've tried uh, infecting the beetles and then they've gone to an oak uh, area of, uh, where there's an oak tree uh, and the transmission was found to be negative. So it mostly depends a lot on the species that are going to those uh, pressure pads as well as uh, where they go after that. Um, just a note regarding the night flying question. Um, they said lepidopterists paint trees with mixes to attract moths at night. Sounds like they need to not use oak for that. That's, that's fair. <laughs> yeah. um, any chance that acorns can harbor oak wilt spores since at least one species feeds on acorns? That's a question I'm, I would have to look into. This didadulid research, um, it's only been doing being conducted by a handful of people. I would I would love to know more about all the different types of transmission. Uh, so um, there's still a lot of questions that we're still trying to figure out. But hopefully, uh, this research and and additional research will be able to nail down some of these questions. So. Um. I'm just putting up this upcoming webinar here um, that we have since we're getting close to the end of our, our time here. All right. Um, the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation recommends interior latex paint. It will slough off in a few weeks and not lead to tree decay. Any thoughts on this? Oh, so we have an actual recommendation, which is good to see. Yeah. 
can you describe how we identify branch flagging? Um, I think we're going to take the rest of the questions uh, and I'll take them afterwards and then I'll get back to them as we go because I think we're out of time right now. Oh yeah, I didn't realize yes. that. <laughs> so. <laughs> Yeah, so I think the questions that are in the chat as well as the questions that are in the question and answer box uh, will be uh, sort of download them uh, from uh, the question area and then we'll be able to uh, answer those uh, if you've left your information. Hopefully we'll be able to uh, send that information along. All right, well, thanks again, David Kavich for presenting today. Thank you all for tuning in. Uh, this webinar was recorded and will be posted on our website at www.invasivespeciescenter.ca. Uh, just a reminder to please take a couple of minutes to fill out our survey. It would be really appreciated. Um, like David said, our next webinar will be on August 3rd at 11 a.m. and it's titled A Good News Story, Community-Led Stewardship in an Urban uh, Landscape. So stay tuned for that. Thanks everyone.